good to see everybody back this evening. Let's get started. Uh, hymn number 406, The Solid Rock. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid, not the stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness seems to hide his face, What happened? Popped you? I saw that. Man, I thought I'd done said something good. Kevin's up there dancing in the sound booth. <laughs> Man, got the power right there. Well, that something shocked him. Anyway, uh, good to see you back in the Lord's house tonight. Thank you for being here. Uh, well, I, I tell you what, I've said this already. Y'all probably sick of hearing it, but I, I love it when it gets dark early so I don't have any pressure. You don't have to worry about it getting out before dark. It's already dark, so I just preach as long as I want to. Just go, cat, go. Anyway, uh, remember the messages, uh, messages, remember the message from this morning, remember the announcements uh, from this morning as well. Uh, anybody wants to stay after church, we've got some more decorating to do, not a whole lot, thankfully, uh, not a whole bunch of stuff needs to be done still, but we do have some, so anybody wants to stay and help with the decorating, please do, uh, we'll get that knocked out and we'll have all our Christmas decorations up, looking forward to, uh, to, to seeing all of that in place. Stock the pantry, uh, party for Miss Ashley Atkins. Uh, December 3rd, that Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4. Also that night, Brother David is going to be reciting a 25-minute poem. And so uh, y'all be here for that. He, he told me he didn't want to preach. I said, well, I'm going to be out, so I want you to write one of those poems you do so good for 25 minutes and do that for me. <laughs> and so he's going uh, he's gonna to be ready. So anyway, yeah, he said he's going to read it three times. I said, don't matter. They won't listen anyway if it's like my sermons. So anyhow, uh, so y'all be, be looking forward to that be praying for him. Uh, also, next Sunday will be Brother Nick's first Sunday at Pilgrim's Rest. And so be praying for him and his family as they start that new journey there. Uh, it'll be a good group of folks to welcome him there, and, and they're getting a good pastor. So very thankful for all of them, and just keep them in your prayers. Uh, Deacons and Wives Christmas Fellowship is going to be here at the church December the 1st at 6 o'clock. Uh, the 50 and up Christmas party here at the church December the 8th at 6 o'clock. That's going to be catered by the Catfish Cabin. Lottie Moon Christmas Offering. Uh, week of Prayer is going to start next Sunday and go through the 10th. Uh, and we'll be uh, praying that week for international missions. And then that Sunday, the 10th, we'll be taking up our offering, our annual Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Is there any other announcement we maybe failed to mention? I think I got them all. All right. Y'all ready to get on with the program? All right. A couple of things that, uh, that have happened uh, today. I know we've had uh, several prayer requests. Had to do a couple of call-outs today, which is unusual for a Sunday. Uh, but uh, Rocky and Griffin. Kennedy were in a car accident this evening, and that was with Timothy Parker's mama. Uh, found that out uh, tonight, and uh, but seems like everybody's well, ma'am. What mother-in-law? Okay, mother-in-law. Uh, and so anyway, sounds like everybody's okay. They're in the emergency room tonight and getting everything checked out. Very thankful for nothing uh, too crucial, but do want to pray for them as they recover uh, from that accident. Uh, and then we've got several folks this week in the hospital and having surgeries and stuff. So we want to remember them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing on service tonight and uh, be praying for all these upcoming activities uh, and we'll give it over to the Lord. Amen. Father, we love you. Thank you tonight for loving us. Thank you for the privilege to be back at church. God, we do ask you tonight uh, as we've come here this evening that we would 
settle our hearts. And Lord, I thank you for the privilege we have to sing your praises. And I pray tonight that we lift our voices and do just that. Uh, it's always something special about coming back on a Sunday night. And I pray uh, that you'll use this service to magnify yourself. I pray tonight, Lord, you'd give me the grace to preach your word. Uh, we just pray that your will be done uh, in and through each and every one of us. And we'll be careful that you get all the glory for it. And it is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. We'll sing uh, 544, Redeemed How I Love to Proclaim It. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed through His infinite mercy, His child and forever. Child and forever I am Redeemed and so happy in Jesus No language my rapture can tell I know that the light of His presence With me doth continually dwell Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty the king in whose law I delight. He lovingly guards my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Child and forever I am. Following along in your hymn book, 575. 575. sing 227 227 praise him praise him Jesus our blessing Excellent greatness, praise Him, 
And not a lot of churches blessed with the talent that our church is blessed with. I'm very fortunate uh, to have what we've got. Brother Jeremy has sure been a blessing today. Appreciate that. It's obvious Miss Misty's been working with him. And, uh, we pray it's a struggle. And we're praying for you. Uh, we're all in this together. It takes a village. We appreciate it. Guarantee you. If you have your Bibles tonight, open to the 84th division of the book of Psalms. Psalms 84 is what we'll look at this evening. Just one verse really tonight that I want us to kind of break apart and look at tonight. Psalms 84 and verse 10. This is a verse many of you have heard, I'm sure. The psalmist says, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Father, I pray tonight you'd bless this message, use it, uh, Lord, to minister to our hearts, Lord, to give us a heart and a desire for your church. And I thank you for our Sunday night crowd. I thank you, Lord, for how you bless in every time we meet. And I pray tonight uh, that you'd bless us afresh and anew. Thank you for the songs this evening that ministered to our heart, that remind us of our redemption, remind us, Lord, of who we belong to. I pray tonight that you'd use that as you minister to our hearts, that you'd bring this word, God, and bless us tonight, even though we don't deserve it. Uh, we just pray that you'd meet with your people. God, we love you tonight, and we do thank you that we have a place to call our church. Uh, Lord, a place that we come together and get to meet with you, get to hear from heaven. And I pray that we do just that tonight. We'll be careful to thank you for what you do, and it is in Jesus' name that we do pray. Amen. I love this verse. Uh, I love the meaning behind this verse. As the psalmist makes this very plain and simple that he has a heart for church. He has a heart to be where the Lord is. He has a, a heart to be in the middle of what it is that God's doing. And when you hear these things that he's saying there in verse 10, uh, there are a couple of things that we'll take from the verse and then one thing that we'll kind of recap uh, that everything that we believe that's being said. When he says, for a day in thy house, or a day rather in thy courts, is better than a thousand. I'd rather be the doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. A few things tonight. First, we'll notice that he declared his love for the house of God. He declares his love for the house of God as he makes this statement, which is basically to say, I'd rather spend one day in church than, <laughs> what is it, two, two and three quarters of another year? Two years and another eight months in the tents of wickedness. Now, when he says tents of wickedness, I want you to understand that he's not talking about anything that's evil or wicked that's going on out there. He's basically referring to any place outside the courts of the tabernacle or outside the courts of the temple. That he'd rather spend a day in the presence of the Lord. He'd rather spend a day in the house of worship than to spend over two years, he says, just dwelling out among the people. When he talks about this, you realize that he has a heart, that he has a love for the house of God. And when you have a love for the house of God, that's because you've got a love for the people of God. Uh, you love the people of the Lord. This is one of the most unique places in all the world that we get together. Of all the things that we do, from work to school to uh, activities to sports that kids play and things like that, church is just such a unique place. Uh, and we come together with the people of the Lord and we get to learn one another and we get to experience times together that we would never experience otherwise. Uh, some of the greatest things that happen to you happen in the house of God. That when you're at church and you see people saved and you see families go through things, a lot of times you won't even know a family that you go to church with until God does something spectacular in their family. 
or when God brings them to a place where one of their children or grandchildren gets saved and you get to see them at a baptism service or get to go through that and experience that together. One of the things I've grown kind of nostalgic, I guess, as a, as a pastor is baptizing people's kids when their kids get saved. Uh, when I, it's, it's a blessing to me to see people's children come to the Lord and be saved and the last revival that I preached, I had a guy there, a boy there saved the last night, was nine years old. And that always ministers to me because I was nine years old when I got saved. And I always think about how big an idiot I was. When I was nine years old, I was the worst kid in the church. Uh, I'm talking about bad to the bone. And I'm reminded of the old proverb that you pay for your raising. Um, I was the worst kid in the church when I was nine years old when I got saved. And all my life as a kid, I was the class clown at school. I was the biggest goofball you've ever seen in your life. And it's not that I'm much better now. Uh, but it's amazing that the Lord used me. It's amazing the Lord had a purpose for me like he has, and it just blows my mind. So every time I see a kid saved, I get excited about the potential of what God can do through them. Now, obviously, God can save an old person and do the same thing, but it's a blessing to think about a kid and the things. You know, there's a song that was written years ago, that, that the things that God saved me from. And it was talking about all the things that by God saving a young person is able to keep them many times from going through some of life's experiences that a lot of people go through uh, that they just don't have to because they got the hand of God on their life because they were saved at a young age. And that's why we minister to kids. That's why we pour so much into our youth ministry and our children's ministry and all these things. Is we want to see those kids come to Christ. We want to see those kids be saved and be rescued from those things. But one of the things as of late, when I see a kid saved or, or, or baptized, I, I think about the time whenever I, I pray that the Lord lets me see that in my own family. Let's see my own kids get saved. I, I pray that, that that happens. You know, you, you, you always don't know, but you pray you get to see your kids come to Christ at a young age and uh, get to be a part of that. And, and it's just something that really ministers to my heart when I see it happen. And I'm almost not jealous, but I just with anticipation wait for that day uh, that hopefully I get to see the same thing take place in my family. You, you have a heart for the people of God. When he talks about his love for the house of God, he's talking about having that heart for the people of God. A day in thy courts is better than a thousand. You realize one of the things you get when you come to church is the camaraderie of corporate worship. You can, anybody can worship. You can worship anywhere. You can worship in your car. You can worship out behind the house. You can worship in your prayer closet. But there's something special about coming together and being with the people of God. And when he says this, there's no doubt that he's referring to the privilege of being able to worship together with the people. Coming together with the people of God in an, in an atmosphere of worship, being a part of the people of God, because in the house of God, that's where you find the people. In the house of God, that's where you find His praises. I love when people lift their voices and sing, and that's why we put so much emphasis on people to sing. And we really encourage you. The reason we put the words up on the screen is not so you can see where Brother Jeremy or Brother Ross or Miss Tiffany or whoever's up here singing, not so you can just make sure they're staying on time. We put the words up there so you can read them and sing along. Amen? We, put, we call out a hymn book so you can open that book up and sing along and get involved and engage yourself. It's a blessing, man. I, I love to get, hear people sing. I love to hear a congregation sing. And there are certain times in our church when folks get a hold of it, man, and I hear people singing, it sends uh, goosebumps up my neck. It makes me want to preach, man. When I hear people singing and worshiping and praising, you know that they're engaged in what it is that's going on. I believe that's what the psalmist was saying. He loved the house of God. He had such a heart for the house of God because that's where the people were, but because among the people that's where the praises are you think about what it's going to be like when we get to heaven one day you don't want to lift your voice and sing tonight but i guarantee you there's a day in heaven you're going to get up there when you see him you're going to start singing amen you're going to have it in your heart to sing and and you think about that day when we get to heaven it's going to be praising we're going to be praising jesus we're going to be worshiping the lord we're going to be lifting high the name of our god and when you think about it it's so easy for us on this side to consider a job a little job or a menial job but when you realize when we get to heaven, anything we get to do for the Lord is going to be incredible. It's going to be the most awesome thing we've ever experienced. And so when he talks about being around the people of God, it's also in being around and surrounded by and encompassed by the praises of the Lord. And it's in that atmosphere that David writes in the Psalms, he says that the Lord inhabits the praises of Israel. And you would think that would be enough to motivate us to lift our voices. If we knew that God would manifest himself, if we would just praise him loud enough, or just praise Him uh, uh, powerfully enough that we would get to see the manifestation of the power of God, I believe we'd all stand up and go to singing. Stand up and lift our voices and shout and praise the Lord. And that's what he's talking about. He went to the house of God. He had a love for the house of God because that's where he found the people. And among the people, he found the praises. And in the heart of the praises is the manifestation of the power of God. When God begins to mend broken spirits, when God begins to minister to the hearts of people, 
When God begins to convict folks' hearts of their sin, that's when the presence of God is manifested. When you can move beyond getting mad at the preacher for saying something that dealt with your sin or getting mad at the teacher for teaching on a lesson that dealt with your sin or a song that seemed like it was... Po- I've heard people say in a crowd of hundreds of people, say, it sounded like you was preaching just to me. Like, well, you better get above me and realize that was a Holy Ghost dealing with your heart. Realize that's the Holy Spirit. You ought to thank God that God would deal with you. And when the presence of God is so good, we'll get beyond that temporal mindset and we'll realize that the God of heaven visited me today. The God of heaven came and spoke to me today and gave me the privilege to hear from Him today and where we can have this same experience in a one-on-one experience with the Lord. There's something powerful about coupling ourselves in the presence of the people of God and seeing God manifest. Because here's the thing, I can go into my prayer closet with a bad attitude. I can go into my prayer closet and go through my prayers and say my thing and I can just boom, 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 do my, do my deal and go on about my business. But there stands a chance that I can come into the house of God with a bad attitude and your preparation will be what brings my blessing. I can come to the house of God and have a bad week, but because other people had a good week and because you've been on your knees praying when I was too hard-headed to get on mine or because you were studying the Word of God when I was too sick or too busy or too tired to study mine, I can be in the same church with you and I can get in on the blessing of God showing up because of your obedience. So we come to the house of God, come to the people of God. He had a heart for the house of God because that's where you saw the power of the Lord and that's because you saw that's where He experienced the presence of the Lord. We need to come into the presence of God and meet in the presence of God. And that's why the psalmist said in this one verse, he said, I love the house of God. I had rather be in the house of God for one day. I'd rather be in thy courts for one day than to go out into those tents and dwell for another couple of years. I'd rather spend that one day in your house. Not only does he declare his love for the house of God, he also demonstrates his loyalty to the house of God. He doesn't just say, I want to be in the house of God. He doesn't say, I want to serve or want to have a a leadership role. He takes basically one of the simplest tasks, and he says, I'd rather rather be the doorkeeper in the house of my God. I'd rather go stand at the back and open the door for the people who are coming to worship. I'd rather simply keep the door in the house of my God than to go out back into the world and dwell for years without Him. To come into that place as a place where He reminds us of His priority. That the house of God in his heart and his life was a place of priority. And it was a place of priority because it was a place of preference. It was a place that he wanted to be. It's one thing to prioritize things. Like when you you write out your budget. You have an annual budget in your home. I'm sure many of you do. When you write out your budget, you have to have so much money for insurance. That's not fun money, right? You have to have so much money you account for taxes. Womp, womp. Can I get a womp? Anybody? You know what I'm talking about. You have to plan for so much percentage of your income is going to go to the government. So much percent of your income is going to go towards your medical insurance. You go so much of your money is going to go towards your homeowners and flood insurance, which, hey, if you need, pay your flood insurance. Amen? Can I, I can witness on that. Pay, have your flood insurance. So much of your money is going to go towards your health insurance or towards your vehicle insurance. And as you allot that money and you spend that money on those certain things, you plan for that in your budget. That's not, as you prioritize and you say, this is my spending money, as you set those things apart, those are things you prioritize you don't get really excited about. But when he made this priority, the house of God, if you're not careful, you'll do that with church. And you say, well, I have to go to church on Sunday. I have to be there on Wednesday night. I have to be in Sunday school or they'll talk bad about me, right? I have to be there and Miss Rita's going to call me and ask me where I was at. I have to be in church. I've got to be there. I've got to sing in the choir. I've got to do... As you set your priorities, if you're not careful, it won't be a priority of preference. It'll turn into a priority of obligation. And I think what was so beautiful about the psalmist's heart for the house of the Lord here was this was not just something he felt like he had to do, but it was something he really wanted to do. And that's why he said, I'll go, I will go to the house of God and keep the door. I'd rather go to the house of God and keep the door than not be there. I'd rather go to the house of God and do the simplest, uh, the hardest, the most uh, job that nobody wants. (laughs) I'd rather take the worst spot in the church than have the best spot outside the church. And I just think that's a priority of preference where we get in our minds and our hearts and we realize that we're here to worship the Lord. We're here, to, we're here to honor the name of the Lord Jesus, the one who died for us. 
And as he talks about these things, he declares his love for the house of God, but he demonstrates his loyalty for the house of God. As it says there in verse 10, a day in your courts is better than a thousand. Obviously, he's talking about how much he loves the house of God, but then saying, I'd rather be the doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness shows that he's loyal to the house of God. These are the two things that I wanted to draw out, but then to blanket those two things with this one thought, and that is that this displays his longing to worship God. I believe with all of my heart that if anybody is genuinely saved, if you have been transformed by the power of God and you know that your sins, not only the sins that you've committed, not only the sins that are in your life tonight, but the sins that you know because of your nature that you are incapable of escaping in your future. If you believe tonight that you've been saved, that you've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus, that He's forgiven your sin, everything you've done, everything you're doing, and everything you're going to do, that God would love you enough to pay the ultimate price for your sin. I believe that that puts a, a, a desire in every believer's heart to worship Him. There is something there that should make anybody that say, you know, we've got so many jokes and so many stories about, about all these uh, uh, things about people that get saved and get baptized and join the church, and then you can't find them with an FBI search warrant. A guy told me a story last week about the squirrels in the attic. I know y'all probably heard this. And the three churches were the squirrels in the attic, and they were trying to figure out what to do with them. And so he went on and on and on, and the Baptist preacher went and got a trap. He caught the squirrels in the attic, in the trap. He baptized them, put them on the church roll, and never saw them again. That's the only way he ever got rid of the squirrels. And you know, it's sad, but in a lot of instances, it's true. If everybody that's on Antioch's church roll showed up Sunday, we'd have to put chairs out. It ought not be that way. God's put something in our heart to worship Him if we're saved. And people get aggravated if you say there's people who are members of churches who are lost that there are lost church members, but the reality is there's lost church members. If not, we'd have to build a building to seat everybody. There's lost church members. There are lost members of this church. There are people who don't know the Lord. They've got a membership. They've been baptized. They've been through the motions, but they don't know Jesus. And so we realize then in that relationship with God, there has to be some appreciable amount of desire to want to worship and to want to be in the house of God. And what he shows here is an absolute display of his longing to worship King Jesus. And I would pray tonight that we hold that in our hearts as well. A longing to worship the Lord and to meet every chance that we get. I'll tell you this, the only way you're going to have a longing to worship the Lord on Sunday is if you exercise worship other days of the week. If you have moments and times in your day that you give God glory, that you study His Word, that you pray and minister to your heart through the Word of God and let God deal with you, that you examine yourself, that you start your day with the Lord, that you, as the Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, trusting that all these other things that we need will be added unto us. A day in thy courts, he says, is better than a thousand. And I'd rather be the doorkeeper in the house of God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. What he's saying to us is he's declaring openly, I love the house of God. And then he demonstrates openly that I'm going to be loyal to the house of God. And whatever position it allows me to serve in, I will be loyal to the house of God. And then again displays this longing that I pray is in all of our hearts for the worship of God. And that's why we offer opportunities for people to do just that. It's for privileges that we have to come into the house of God and to, kind of like the song says, we have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. And that's why we've come. Worship him, worship him, Christ the Lord. That we come to the house of God with a love in our heart. Not just something we have to do, but something that we get to do, that we get to enjoy. And I just love the way this verse bottles up that emotion that this man was going to worship Jesus. He was going to go to the house of God. He was going to be where he needed to be and be in the process of, of focusing his attention and his heart on the Lord Jesus Christ. And that he was going to show that he had a desire to absolutely, genuinely worship God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Thank you for what it means to us and how it ministers to us. And I do pray tonight, Lord, that you would use it to help us, Lord, to have a greater desire for worship. I do pray, Lord, as we meet, every time that we meet in the services we meet in, I pray, God, that the, the, these worship services and worshipful settings that we come into, Lord, will be uh, entered into with an attitude of worship from what we've already experienced in our day-to-day -day walk. 
I pray that we would spend time with you daily. Let your word minister to our heart and draw us closer to you. I pray that we'd make a commitment to pray. I believe only when we do those things will we feel as the psalmist did in this one simple verse that we have such a desire to be in your house. Lord, I thank you for each one that's here tonight. And as we now open your altar and give your invitation, I pray that if there's one here tonight who needs to be saved, that they might come forward and be saved tonight. Lord, if there are others here tonight who have decisions that need to be made or special burdens on their life and they need to get those things dealt with, I pray that you'd minister to their heart and that they would come and understand that they've been invited freely to do just that, that your will be done in their lives and their burdens be lifted. And we'll give you all the praise for what you do tonight. And it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Y'all stay.